Hello, welcome to Behind the Wall. I'm Stan Grant. There's no denying we are living through a period of great upheaval with uncertainty being felt around the globe. A rising China has complicated relationships with other dominant powers like the United States and with its neighbours, both friend and foe. And the Sleeping Dragon is not afraid to show off its military might in a provocative way. Just recently, the Chinese military participated in an exercise simulating an island invasion. The same weekend that Taiwan celebrated its national day. But how significant a threat does the People's Liberation Army pose in our region and what is its ultimate goal? Jeremy Fernandez took a closer look. <laughs> China's vast military is a paradox. It's governed by the Chinese Communist Party's pledge to abide by the rule of law in international relations. At the same time, it's expanding rapidly under what President Xi Jinping calls the Chinese dream to restore China as a great power. Those twin ideals raise questions about its long-term strategic ambitions. The strength of a nation's economy usually dictates how much it spends on its military. In other words, the more money you make, the more you can spend on defence and strategic goals. Economically, China has outpaced most countries in the past 30 years, and that's helped it build one of the most powerful defence forces in the world. It's estimated to have about 2 million active duty troops and 660,000 armed police. Its arsenal includes about 3,200 aircraft, more than 750 naval vessels, 3,500 army tanks and almost 300 nuclear warheads. Then there's the United States, one of our closest allies whose firepower overshadows the rest of the world. They're believed to have almost one and a half million active troops, more than 13,000 aircraft, 490 vessels in the Navy, more than 6,000 tanks and a vast nuclear arsenal. Historically, these nuclear warheads have made the US the most formidable force in the world. Other nations have gradually built their own stockpiles, but the Americans retain the advantage by being able to launch military assets from a huge range of positions in the world with help from their allies. And critically, because it also has more aircraft carriers and missile submarines. The US can launch fighter jets from 11 carriers. China has just two. The Americans can also field an imposing force below the waves with 18 nuclear-powered missiles submarines. There are six Chinese vessels with similar capabilities. These are the disparities that China has been working hard to overcome. We've seen China essentially emerge uh, at the end of the Cold War as a small outdated Soviet era institution and uh, grow its defense budget by 900 uh, percent between 1996 and today. And in the last decade alone, it's doubled um, its defense expenditures. These are the disparities that China has been working hard to overcome. The latest images from China's military shipbuilding yards show it's on track to have four aircraft carriers on the water in the next few years, and a total of six by 2035. And while it still leaves it short of the US, it almost certainly ticks a few boxes on some of its main military goals. Increasingly, uh, they see themselves as, as uh, having uh, the decisive advantage over the United States, at least uh, within our own region, within Asia, within Southeast Asia, if not globally. And that seems to have been um, the a very a deliberate campaign on the part of the Chinese um, and closely paired with their efforts to modernize their military. China is also making big gains in military technology. And unlike most other countries, it's invested heavily in making its military equipment at home. It's now the world's second biggest arms producer. But there are challenges ahead. China still lags in the recruitment, training and retention of a professional fighting force on such a large scale. By 2050, its workforce is expected to decline by 158 million people and its population 20% smaller than that of India. It's also fighting dissent from separatist movements in multiple provinces. And then there are the disputed land borders with countries such as India and North Korea. And what that means for China's interpretation of international law will be critical to 
to understanding how it plans to exercise its power. Malcolm Davis is a senior analyst in defence strategy and capability at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and he joins me now from Canberra. Malcolm, good to have you on the program. Let's look first of all at where the potential flashpoints are that could tip us into a broader conflict with China. Well, look, I think firstly you have to look at Taiwan. Uh, it's very clear that China is ramping up pressure, coercive pressure on Taipei. Uh, with the aim to force them to unify with China on China's terms. I don't see that happening and so the risk is that in the coming months and potentially years you will see China be tempted to use military force and you mentioned that island um, landing exercise mm. uh, that's directly aimed at Taiwan. The second area is of course the South China Sea where China and the United States and other uh, regional powers uh, lock horns on a regular basis and the risk of a miscalculation there leading to a broader conflict is high. I think the third uh, area of concern has to be along the India-China border mm -hmm. uh, near Ladakh uh, where you've already had fighting between Chinese and Indian forces. That could easily escalate out of control. And then the fourth area would, have, would be the East China Sea where China and Japan have territorial disputes over the Senkaku Islands. And there's a possibility there that that could escalate. Now in each of these cases, Taiwan, India, Japan, they are conflicts that could potentially flare much more widely than just a regional conflict. It could bring in other powers and could even involve Australia. I, I want to look first of all here at China's military capacity to fight that sort of a conflict, a regional conflict. We hear a lot about things like anti-access area denial, a complicated term, but break that down for us. How would China fight a regional conflict given that it doesn't have the military strike power of, say, the United States? How could it fight that sort of war and win? Well, look, I think you're right to highlight the anti-access area denial or A2AD as it's called. Um, China's objective with that is to hold at risk US military forces as far away as possible. And they're extending their strike capabilities using advanced ballistic missile systems and cruise missile systems uh, to be able to hit US forces as far out as Guam. That's a long way away from China. And if they can raise the cost of US intervention to unacceptable levels, then their goal is to deter that intervention or if that deterrence fails, to inflict devastating losses on US forces. That could, for example, include sinking a US carrier or two. And so the potential for that sort of conflict to escalate rapidly and widely, uh, to see US retaliation and to drag in other states, including Australia, I think would be very high. Now, the, the RAND Corporation a few years ago looked into this and wargamed possible scenarios in a, a report it called Thinking the Unthinkable. Well, it's now no longer unthinkable, is it? Improbable, perhaps, but potentially this is the type of conflict we could see unravel. And when you looked at how RAND saw something like that uh, un unfolding, um, the longer it went, potentially the greater China's capacity to prevail and, of course, devastating, devastating casualties. I think when you look at uh, Australia's defence strategic update that was released in July of this year, uh, the whole tone and content of that reinforces the perception quite rightly that I think we're in a pre-war period mm. akin to the 1930s. And so we have to prepare for that large, high-intensity interstate war that could occur in the next few years between China and the United States that would bring in Australia and Japan and others. And I think you're also quite right to point out the possibility that that war may not be a short, sharp war. It may be a prolonged war lasting months or even years that would see direct attack on Australia's territory uh, because we would be hosting US forces and it's highly unlikely that China would allow those US forces to operate from Australian bases unmolested. So attacks on the north, uh, uh, the loss of uh, combat forces, including some of our ships, uh, and the potential risk of rapid escalation, including through the nuclear threshold, I think is high. Yeah, and let's hope we don't get to, to that point. Um, and there is some way between now and, and the worst case scenarios. But I, I do want to look, Malcolm, at what how China is preparing itself and building its military capacity. There's a lot of 
discussion about and speculation about what China actually spends on its military. Its official spend is around about $170 billion. I've seen some estimates that put it over $400 billion, around about 80% of what perhaps the United States is spending. How do you see that at the moment? I think that's an accurate assessment. I think certainly the Chinese don't give the full picture in terms of their defence spending. Uh, the focus of their defence spending is on anti-access air denial capabilities to strike at US and allied forces at long range and with great speed. Also investment into force projection capabilities. They're starting to build up long range naval and aviation capabilities that can project power and presence into Southeast Asia and beyond into the Southwest Pacific and also the Indian Ocean. So Australia's um, regional approaches for air and maritime approaches could be seeing increasing presence of Chinese forces. And finally, the area they're investing a lot of money in is space and counter space capabilities designed to be able to strike at US and allied space capabilities from the outset. Now that, that's something I wanted to come to as well, because there is a scenario that's been described as a space Pearl Harbor. And that is that China can launch a, 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 a surprise attack, and just as the Japanese did in Pearl Harbor in, in World War II. That they can launch a surprise attack that dismantles or makes inoperable American military satellites. What impact would that have? Um, what is the capability to do that? And how could that possibly happen undetected? Well, the US is incredibly dependent on its space capabilities to gain and maintain an information edge uh, in war. You saw in the 1991 Persian Gulf War, the reason the Americans were so decisive and so successful was because they, have, they had a knowledge edge over uh, the forces of Iraq. The same approach is used by US forces elsewhere. Uh, achieving that knowledge edge, knowledge edge is critical and space capabilities are essential to provide that. So Chinese development of counter space capabilities involves uh, the development and testing and deployment of anti-satellite weapons, including uh, kinetic attack that would physically destroy a satellite, as well as soft kill capabilities that would disable a satellite. And these systems are being developed by the Chinese. They are being tested and deployed. And so we have to be ready for the prospect that prior to or at the outset of a future military conflict, the Chinese could launch a series of attacks uh, with surprise against our critical space capabilities to lead, lead us uh, deaf, dumb and blind from the outset. And then, then that takes away our knowledge edge. And what you're talking about there is America effectively left blind to some respects. Exactly. And so therefore they can't bring their precision strike capabilities to bear. They can't effectively maneuver uh, air and maritime forces with coordination and effective precision because they can't see what's happening. Now, the Americans are going to respond by trying to deter those uh, Chinese counter space capabilities and defend satellites. And the establishment of the US Space Force by the Trump administration is part of the response to those Chinese space threat capabilities. And I think what you could then see down the track is the possibility that the Americans start developing their own counter space capabilities. And you end up, of course, with an arms race in space. Yeah, it's a sobering thought but an important uh, conversation. Malcolm, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you again. Thank you.